imagine a podium into existence. Yeah. opportunity to present here. I'm basically now uh, taking your attention away from the Golden North to the Hewland abodes of Africa. Um, and the paper or the presentation is um, using the metabolic uh, framework, just to put it out there, uh, influenced by uh, uh, the um, John Bellamy Foster and Co. Uh, and I think it's an important framework. And I, and I appreciate the critique, but uh, one of its uh, central features is the alienation between humans and nature, which is one of the central or enduring features of cities under capitalism. Cities in Africa are no exception. They are experiencing a rapid process of urbanization, deep, further deepening the antagonism between town and country, and the separation between the spaces of production and the spaces of reproduction. Right. Uh, the colony has been an environmental crisis, a growing surplus population, and a crisis of social reproduction for, for the laboring classes. What uh, environmental sociologist uh, uh, Foster and Clark calls a corporeal rift. Now, they argue that to, to restore or mend this metabolic rift, uh, consisting of both the ecological, social, and individual dimension, requires a transformation in the relationship between humans and nature to ensure more sustainable social metabolism. Now, I can't, so what I'm focusing on is in uh, Africa, and Africa is not a country, uh, particularly South Africa, um, and looking at the, uh, the city of Cape Town, which the ruling elites are trying to model as a world-class city uh, uh, around tourism and uh, high-tech industry. But what is, what is happening in, in the city of Cape Town and across African cities is that urban workers and the unemployed are engaging in, live, in land occupation for livestock raising and agricultural crop production, reconfiguring what I call, in the lack, uh, lack of a better word, the semi-proletarian condition in the city, right? And making them important ecological actors in the broader um, ecological or environmental struggle. Well, there's been a tendency of what uh, Lefebvre and Brenner and Smith called the uh, urbanization of the countryside, or what they call planetary urbanization. Uh, what, what I contend is that in African cities, we are also observing a counter tendency, what I call the agrarianization of the city, right? And I argue that occupying land for livestock and agricultural crop production, urban residents are transforming the socio-ecological relations and the landscape in the city with imminent potential for restoring a, a more sustainable social metabolism. Moreover, it allows us to enter into the hidden abode of everyday life to uncover processes of urbanization and class formation that is its own specificity in African cities and the global south more broadly, often that is analyzed through pre-given categories, right? So from Europe and the US and the North, we are given categories and we have to analyze our own objective reality through that categories. And uh, part of what I'm trying to do with this paper is to disrupt some of these uh, notions and, and, and extend our imagination to think about how processes unfold in the Global South uh, has its own specificity, although there is a general tendency and with, it is with the specificity that we have to deal with. Now, I'm looking at three uh, occupation sites and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it in the context of both actuality and potential. And it's a method of inquiry, investigating potential or how social processes unfold. So it's not the end result. So we're looking at a process when uh, subaltern classes engage in struggle and how that process unfolds. Now, uh, Bertel Ullmann explains that investigating uh, potential is taking a longer view, not only forward to what something can develop into, but also backward to how it has developed up to now. This provides us with a method of investigation to study 
processes as it unfold, with all its messiness, contradictions, and limitations, disrupting the scholarly impulse to search for pristine cases, right? That we can model around through posters, and, and, and reality is not that pristine. It's messy, and there's contradiction of class, gender, all of it embedded in our case studies that we often don't highlight in, in this search for these uh, sacred alternatives, right? So I, I'm not adding this to say that the case I am presenting has all the messiness it does have and it should have, and it should allow us to learn from, from, from that thing. But what is important, and I think Gillian Hart adds a, a, another layer to our method of investigation, and she draws our attention to the political stakes of our research and our theorization. And she argues that it helps us to generate new understandings of the possibilities for social change, right? Uh, to put it differently, is like, what is the political stakes of our research and theorization, right? For example, if we put forward world ecology, what is the political implications of that? And how are we going to use that uh, for our struggle beyond capitalism, right? And although I'm not arguing there is no room for theorization and creating analytical frameworks, but I'm also saying we have to take the next step. Uh, and think about what is the political stakes and the implication of our theorization. So I'm arguing and, and drawing on other people's work that alternative theorization will, will emerge out of real existing class struggles, often neglected in social science scholarship, right? Now in our earlier panel with uh, Eric and Annie, them, uh, they were drawing on how we can learn from the Campesino Campesino movement. So this is real existing uh, class struggle that we can extrapolate and develop uh, theoretical frameworks. Now, uh, this was true for Marx as well in writing Capital and uh, the, the, the struggles in the Paris Commune and how that influenced in how we structured capitalism and that is uh, being part of uh, social science scholarship. Just uh, on the case studies that I'm presenting, they're all in the city of Cape Town. Um, they have uh, been occupying land during the apartheid period and the post-democratic South Africa. So the earliest occupation was in 1985, during the height of the fascist uh, regime in South Africa. Uh, the number of individuals per site uh, or households, the, the largest group is about 269 households, and the largest tract of land is about 240 hectares or uh, 593 acres on the urban edge, right? So, uh, and the plot sizes uh, vary from one hectare to five hectares, depending on the different sites and how it's organized. A key thing that I want to emphasize is that in terms of their rural ties, uh, in the one group, weak rural ties with no intention of going back to the countryside. The other case uh, of, is where people have strong rural ties, both land in the countryside and in the urban areas where they've occupied land. These are all illegal occupations, right? And so, what this brings me to uh, <coughs> the, the next uh, uh, point is to how do we then uh, think about uh, what I call co-presence and the agrarianization of the city. Um, so, as I've said, the planetary urbanization theory, or as uh, Brenner called it, a meta-theoretical exercise, to understand the seismic transition in the 21st century is important. Uh, however, while the meta theory focuses on the tendency towards a historical general totality, we also need to pay attention to the historical specific uh, totality and the relation between the two, a point that uh, Archie Mafeje, the African uh, anthropologist, made. So, meta theory often has the unintended consequence of eliminating specificity and distinct social formation that does not conform to Eurocentric or Northern-centric conceptualization. The point is that capitalism and urbanization, particularly in the Global South, does not and cannot presume to be to manifest itself or be transformed in an identical manner everywhere. Right? So, this brings us where we then ascribe to cities uh, conflate class and space. If you are urban, you are proletarian, informal proletarian, whatever you are called, rural, peasants, uh, rural workers, all of that. And 
what we characterize as cities today as an urban proletariat, prim primarily relying on wage labor, and a growing mass of informal labor relegated to the urban slums. But in South Africa, the slums is not just uh, for informal settlements, people who are unemployed and surplus population. There are also stable <coughs> wage workers in slums, right? But we have this normal trope in how we think about urban slums, and we have to understand how the real estate market also functioning, that you have stable employed people in slums. Like, uh, they are not uh, irregularly employed or in, in that sense. But this brings us back to uh, what the philosopher Marcelo Matombak talks about, the co-presence of different temporal formations, or the rural in the urban, that has been an enduring feature of, of South African cities in Africa more broadly. So his conception moves us away from this linear articulation and dissolution, right? So the peasantry is dispossessed, and then they become wage uh, laborers, right? Uh, people like Bernstein, Harold Wolpe, where non-capitalist formation are seen as capitalism's other, right? Instead, what is considered archaic or formation from a non-capitalist milieu should be seen as our contemporary and part of new social formations in city, right? So if, if we have used the, the metaphor of a geolo geological layer, right? So these non-capitalist formations does not get dissolved, right? But it gets, capitalism subsumes it and makes it part of its own uh, process of accumulation, right? And this insight it, it allows us to, to view the different geological layers as part of capitalist uh, modernity. And I'm, I'm sort of uh, trying to hit this point home before I get to uh, the, the group because I think it's important because we, we tend to think about people are dispossessed uh, and then they, they go and sell their wage labor. But in Africa we have to ask ourselves the important question, what is la wage labor an expression of? Now, Arrighi in his study of Calabria and Italy uh, with Pacelli, he says, we cannot presume that the sale of labor power through multiple determination and process cannot be taken a priori as an expression of proletarianization or depeasantization. Wage labor can either be an expression of semi-proletarianization or of a landless peasantry or of proletarianization or an expression of petty accumulation, right? So if we assume that people are selling their wage labor, that we cannot assume that just, they are proletariat. They might also just be peasants uh, engaging in wage labor with the hope of uh, going back to the countryside in a future day. And this is precisely the history of South Africa that I'm arguing that land and labor has always been intertwined in the history of class, class development and the capitalist development in South Africa. So it's a false notion in Africa in, to, to talk about the transition from feudalism to capitalism because there was never feudalism in South Africa, right? It's a different social formation that we have to deal with. And, and when I talk about these categories that we impose uh, on countries to understand processes of agrarian uh, transition would lead people to the conclusion that there is no agrarian question because we think through the lens of Europe, particularly Western Europe. Right? in the case of England, to, to analyze the rest of society. So Africa and the global south becomes uh, Europe's other. And you just impose categories on that, and, and that is how we sort of try to explain uh, processes. Right? But we, we cannot think of a city like Cape Town in, in the same way we think of New York, because its process of, of, of city formation is, is completely different. Right? So for example, the migrant labor system in South Africa defines how the city is developed because that migrant labor that moves between rural and, and, and urban and rural be, then becomes the basis for urban, the formation of the urban uh, class or urbanization in South Africa. And it's an outcome of, of struggle. So what we have in South Africa is that uh, rural classes or what we can call them peasants are dispossessed of the land, but in the same process they are tied to the land through the migrant labor system. So there's this contradictory uh, 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 process that are taking place, right? So it disrupts this notion that, okay, transition from capitalism to freedom means of they are dispossessed from the means of production. So this is how we have to look at the 
urban land occupation for livestock raising. And I resist the impulse to just say, ah, it's just urban agriculture, because I think it's something more than just urban agriculture. It, is, uh, it allows us to see the co-presence of different historical formations with, embedded within city. And sometimes because uh, they get hidden through the process of wage labor, selling the labor power, we confuse what we call a proletariat is an actually, in fact, a landless peasantry. And landless peasantry, what I define as people who have less than uh, two hectares, but it's not enough to uh, produce a livelihood uh, through that land and has to sell them uh, for wage labor as, as well. So in the city of Cape Town, what people are doing is producing uh, livestock, uh, uh, pigs, in particular pig farming, uh, goats, uh, on the urban edge. And they are supplying uh, a growing informal uh, working class uh, market, right? So they engage in market relation, but not in the normal process of, 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 of accumulation. So key of their production strategy or livelihood strategy is the collection of waste uh, material from the fresh produced markets, from restaurants, schools, and also households, and feeding that into their livestock and also in the process for the development of crop production, right? And in the process, they are redeveloping, uh, raise the soil, uh, reduce waste to landfill by making compost and selling food to neighboring working class communities, right? And also feed for their livestock. Now, here's the interesting thing again. So if you go to a city like Cape Town, you will see meat vendors, particularly women, selling meat on the street to other working class uh, people in the morning. Uh, most of that is characterized as the informal food market, which is correct. But there's another step that what people are not saying, these are also farmers that are producing this. So the same women would be engaged in pig production, uh, wake up early in the morning at 6, <coughs> from between 6 and 8 in the morning, sell that to other working class men and women who are going to work, and then retreat back to her farming for, to take care of her animal production. So in the same class, you have this multiple uh, uh, individuals that have different class expression, right? That easily can confuse us and say, ah, oh, this is just an informal uh, proletariat uh, because they have a crisis of re social reproduction, they are selling meat on the street, but it's something uh, beyond that. The, the, the other important uh, thing is that also that they are combining agricultural production and recycling uh, as an important livelihood stra strategy. So wa waste provides a livelihood strategy. But why does it allow them? Because they have land, right? And they can move beyond agricultural production, and so they're also collecting waste, right? But herein lies its limitations and contradiction, because a reliance on capital uh, for, for waste material like restaurants and businesses also draw them into the logic of capital accumulation and in the process they're also providing a subsidy to capital that otherwise had to pay the cost of getting rid of those waste to landfills. Now they are drawing on all these host of small scale farmers to incorporate that waste uh, in the same time uh, improving the soil and providing a service but also subsidizing capital, right? And this is one of the uh, limitations and contradictions that we, and the messiness of this whole uh, program that we have to deal with, right? So I will, uh, since I have uh, 20 minutes, I will just go uh, to the last 20 slides. So, <laughs> what, what does, and I use the city because uh, we all have conceptions of what a city should look like. So, the city has always been a, a contestation, at least in, a, in South Africa, over space. Even in the height of we had the fascist apartheid regime, they couldn't uh, uh, break the, because it was a contestation of a struggle. People just occupied and put up housing, right? Uh, rural migrant peasants from the countryside, because there was what employment was. But this leads us to an important question that we have to begin to theorize the urban dimension of the agrarian question. Right? Because the agrarian question is often phrased as a rural phenomenon. But what these people and the struggle over contestation of space 
is saying as they are imagining a different way in which the city should be conceived, right? And when the city, the land, the interesting thing is the land that they are occupying, the city is saying, we want to build houses for other low-income people. And they are saying, well, we, are, we have housing and we want to move beyond that, so can't we have a way of conceiving of the city? And the ruling elites are resisting that, but people are also resisting from below to say, this is how we are conceptualizing uh, uh, cities, right? So just my last point is that this is an interesting thing because during the process of struggle, to my last point, they forge alliances with rural movements, a particular movement linked to Via Campesina. And when they took over the leadership, the, uh, I'm talking about the, agra the uh, agrarian reform, food sovereignty for agrarian reform movement, became very radicalized, right? And they were the ones who promoted in South Africa, through their own experience, they said, land occupation as the new land reform for South Africa. It did not come from urban, from rural peasants, but from these urban dwellers within the city. So it really changes our uh, conceptualization of how we have to think about who are the social forces, rural and urban, that is going to take us beyond post-capitalist transition? What is the organizational form uh, uh, that we have to think about? And what type of state is necessary for, for, for that transition? Thank you very much.